This is exciting, and actually Glenda's not here, which is a total shock to me, because Glenda's always here, bless her heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> but nobody else is here, Glenda is here. So anyway, um, hopefully we'll have some more people popping in uh, later during the Hangout, and um, I thought that we could get started by me um, showing you that I brought some uh, books that I think have good examples of um, dialect and voice in them. Here's one. Uh, it looks like backwards for whatever reason. Um, Fire, upon the Fire upon the deep by Werner Vinge. That one has some really cool um, use of use of uh, language. Here's another one. The Shifter by Janice Hardy. Oh yeah. Great voice in this one. Um, I'm biased. I helped Janice critique it, but anyway. Everybody know this? Oh, I really like that author. Yeah, well, actually, it wasn't referring to me, though. I'm actually going to be um, <laughs> referring to uh, this particular story by Mike Flynn. Mike Flynn does fantastic things with voice and dialogue. Um, then I have my go-to from me, which is Cold Words, which I had super fun with. Hey, David, join! Uh, thank you for joining us. Can you hear us? Uh, yes. Oh, and I can just start to hear you. Well, Excellent. I'm and, and then the last one I have is this one, Blood and Honey by Stina Light. Why have I never heard of any of these? Because they're modern and cool and and not classics. Well, Werner Vinci's kind of a classic, but but yeah. So, um So, all of those will hopefully be able to um do a little bit of reading from them was what I was thinking at different points. How are you, David? Um I don't know if that's going to work. Did it work? Oh, it worked. Okay. Yeah, I hear you pretty well, actually, at this point. Fantastic. Um, I think I'm okay. <laughs> great. Well, it's great yeah. to see you. So, um, so okay. Um, dialects and voice, I'm kind of aiming to go away or, or to stay away a little bit from from conlanging itself in this discussion simply because if we start conlanging we will be here all day and we'll never get to dialects and voice. <laughs> uh, yeah, your arm is on one of the cameras, uh, Aaron. <laughs> um, but that works for me. So, um, so David, let me ask you just to start off since, since you have a lot of uh, stuff that you've done. Do you work on dialects when you do uh, your show languages? Uh, well, it depends on the extent uh, to which they appear or will appear uh, in the show. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for example, in something like Defiance, all we see are the, are the people and aliens that live in Defiance, and so mm -hmm. they're very localized. By a kind of default or definition, the dialect I'm working on is the dialect of that local area. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's something to—it's something that I always keep in mind, and something I'm always wondering, which is, you know, what happens, like, uh, you know, elsewhere. You know, for <laughs> example, in in defiance, you know, the aliens landed all over the planet, and we're focusing on one area, the United States. Um, I always wondered what would happen, especially because, um, really, like, kind of the internet was knocked out, so there's not really a lot of communication. It goes mm -hmm. on very easily between different parts of the world. Um, different languages, or, or I'm sorry, the languages that, that fall there are going to be influenced by, by the languages around them, and so. Oh, I can totally imagine like pigeonization and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you know that's that's what I do, except that I work with English, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to like you know, let's say some of them fell in France. Actually, a lot of them, uh, a lot of the South alien, America. Yeah, in Brazil. I can't do it. Oh, I see. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, there's a there's a huge concentration in Brazil, so you know what's going to end up happening there is it's going to be uh, markedly less influenced by English and a lot more influenced by 
um, Portuguese, uh, I'm sorry, Brazilian Portuguese. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now, in a in in Game of Thrones, you actually are going to see um, a new a new dialect as opposed to a new language coming uh, next season. Yeah. yeah. So tell All us right. about it. What's, what it, what um, what makes it a dialect? Well, I've already said too much about it, really. But uh, ah! what <laughs> okay. What, so what makes so it, okay. So let's move away from your particular project because you're not yeah. supposed to talk about it, and let's talk about what dialect means. Right. Um, uh, well, there is a there is an actual linguistic definition, which you know I, I I'm sure you know, but then for the benefit of our millions of uh, viewers, um, <laughs> that's right. The, uh, you, usually the uh, distinction, first of all, the distinction between uh, whether uh, two modes of speaking are different dialects or whether they're different languages is uh, a matter of uh, mutual intelligibility. So, um, you know, we can speak to people from London without too much complication. Mm -hmm. You know, if we start if we start talking about, you know, uh, chips and french fries, we'll be, there'll be a little confusion, but, you know, outside of that, I mean, you know, the grammar is by and large the same. The vocabulary is like ninety percent the same. Um, Aaron, you just dropped out for some reason. No. But, oh, okay. I didn't. No, I, I see it. I see it. I see it. Um, and so um, we call those uh, two different dialects of the same language uh, mm -hmm. because of the mutual intelligibility. Now that begins to break down as you, you know, as you go on. So, like, uh, I, I would say that um, Hindi and Urdu. Are maybe um, a little there. They, you wouldn't call them separate languages, but I think that they are um, more distinct from one another than, say, London English and American English. Um, uh -huh. Whereas something like you know Portuguese and Spanish, uh, at, which at one point in time were dialect distinctions, have gotten to the point right. where they're mutually unintelligible, um, and that I think. To a large extent, is also true of Catalan and uh, Castilian Spanish in Spain. Okay, um, so even those let me closer. ask you the Chinese question. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, often we talk about, say, Cantonese, Taiwanese, um, Mandarin, as though they're dialects of Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. When, to my understanding, they are often mutually unintelligible. Yeah, and that's that's true. But um, this is where kind of the uh, Sociopolitical definition of dialect comes into play. Mm -hmm. This is why, um, for example, we generally use the language uh, or the uh, vocabulary of different languages when talking about Hindi and Urdu, mm -hmm. but we use um, you know the vocabulary of dialects when talking about the mutually unintelligible languages of China. Um, it's it's mainly a political thing where kind of China wants to kind of almost pretend that really there's only one language that everybody speaks and there are mm. just different dialects when okay. it's not the so case. Okay, so yeah, sort of the an ideological pretend. same is actually true of Spain. Pretend. Yeah, uh, if you remember during the 92 Olympics, um, there was kind of a, a big stir where, you know, they really wanted to say that there was just one language spoken in Spain, there was just Spanish, and not only that, Castilian Spanish was the most purest form of language. It was the best form of language, and it and it caused quite a stir when, um, for the opening ceremonies of the '92 Olympics, the um, he was the mayor of Barcelona, uh, spoke in Catalan, and it was mm -hmm. uh, yeah kind of uh, upsetting to you know the the the, the Spanish the, or at least the Castilian speakers. Um, but there was okay. What, what was it? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to mention this other one just because it's uh, it's of relevance. There's also um, the idea of not so much like a, you know political divisions with dialects, but also just like kind of a social um, idea. And this is what happens with Arabic in the Middle East. Um, uh, generally, um, people want to say that they speak different dialects of Arabic. Um, and that everybody is just speaking one language. Mm -hmm. uh, when, in point of fact, you know, somebody from Egypt couldn't understand somebody from Morocco at all. Uh -huh. um, they're just they're just too distinct. Uh, they're too different. Um, there is a continuum there where it's like you know it's it's easier for somebody from Egypt to understand somebody from um, what's that what's that what's that country um, Tunisia I want to say uh, I'll, yeah Tunisia than somebody from Morocco um, because they're kind of uh, closer a little bit and they share vocabulary. 
But having said that, they share this language, um, modern standard Arabic, which is mm -hmm. a, a just somewhat modernized version of Quranic Arabic, which everybody who goes to school learns but nobody uses in their day-to-day -day life. So they, they, they all have this kind of understanding of this, you know, Ur language, this almost fictional language, modern standard Arabic, that, um, you know, highly educated speakers can use and professionals, right. professional people will use, but um, which, you know, the day-to-day the -day person doesn't really have a lot of contact with and doesn't use a lot. They still have that register in their mind, and so sure. that helps perpetuate the idea that everybody is just speaking Arabic with little differences, even though that's not the case. Well, anymore. that that happens, I think, all over the world, and and um, I know that, for example, standard Japanese has a uh, has a sort of monolithic uh, status uh, when when in fact the the dialects of hello Glenda when uh, in fact the dialects of Japan differ quite widely. Mm. Um, and and are actually quite difficult <laughs> for uh, somebody who has learned standard Japanese, which is what they teach to foreigners, to come in and land in Kyoto, which is what I did. I was like, "What are they speaking?" <laughs> so, um, yeah. so yeah, and I think that's that's one of those issues where it's like the question of is this thing a dialect or is it a language? Uh, it's uh, the answer can be different depending on what you value or what's important. So, like, if you are a non-native speaker who has been learning a language, right, you know, mm -hmm. you've been learning Parisian French or, or whatever, and you just get plunked down in a different part of the country, you know, it's going to be more important to you <laughs> that these things are very different than to somebody who says, oh, no, 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 they're just dialects. It's like, well, that may be the case, but I'm having a really hard time here. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and with the mutual intelligibility thing, Am I echoing? Um, no. Yes, just a minute. Okay. Uh, with the mutual intelligibility thing, I know um, sometimes when you tell people about it, they're like, oh, well, but, you know, I speak Spanish, and when I was talking to an Italian bu bus driver, I could totally understand him. And it's like, well, yes. Yeah. You can get directions, but you're not going to have a philosophical discussion and have everything come through. Like sometimes people try and argue that close cousin languages are dialects rather than separate languages. And it's like, well, there's there's mutual intelligibility and then there's mutual intelligibility. Mm -hmm. Like yes, you could probably save them from getting trampled to death or something, but you're not going to be able to have that be, you know, the you're not going to be able to have a really in depth discussion. Right, and also I think it's really important to acknowledge the the, the cultural distinctions. Um, very often, dialects are spoken by people who are culturally very distinct, and the the dialect and its legitimacy is very critically tied to the culture in question. And I might add um, that uh, the concept of native speakerhood is much more complicated than a lot of people usually think about when they think about it. It's not something that I want to go into right now. I have an article about it on the blog, so if you want to look for it, um, look for it under the myth of the native speaker, um, because that is something that we can talk about another time. Uh, anyway, all right, so um, Speaking of, uh, let's get to uh, dialects in uh, science fiction and fantasy. Uh, do you guys have examples of things that you think have done dialects really well? Um, or, you know, so let me start by saying it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine when there are no dialects uh, in a population that is spread over large area and may not have um, and may not have uh, may not have a lot of travel in between the different areas. Okay, we were talking about travel last week, um, <laughs> and and one of the pet peeves that I believe it was Aaron mentioned was when people go traveling across an entire continent and there's absolutely no distinction between the people in the different areas. Um, People do speak differently. 
And not only do they speak differently, but they speak differently for particular reasons. Um, and those, uh, D David, I know, is a, somebody who does a lot of aging of languages. Um, but essentially, the concept is that the longer a, a language has been in a particular area of the world, and the less people can talk to each other easily between one area and the next, the more the languages will diverge in those areas and dialects will arise and eventually separate languages may arise. Um, so those right. are, that's, that's for folks following along at home. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important when you're talking about world building and when you're talking about um, putting together a story about diverse groups of people to think through whether people are going to speak differently from one another in different regions. And yeah. sociopolitically too. Expand upon that. Ah, so so I'm ta I'm thinking about uh, socioeconomic status, um, mm, right, right, or right. or racial divisions, where um, there is a particular style of speech that's utilized between people who are coexisting within the same city, for example, um, but because of speech patterns and who talks with whom, typically, uh, you don't get a lot of um, you don't get a lot of, of cross-learning of the dialect between the groups, and so you'll have these coexisting dialects within one area. Yeah, that's something that's really easy to do if you have uh, the language there to fall back on, because then you can demonstrate the difference. I think that that's probably why uh, with, um, with English, uh, you know, or with novels written in English, the most often what you see <laughs> is um, uh, either the using the uh, the stereotypically stigmatized versions of American English. So um, <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you'll see a lot of uh, that instead of uh, ing, even though we all say it anyway. Um, in writing, for some reason, it's more. Oh, in yeah. Yeah, as opposed to ing. Yeah. Uh, you know, people will drop those in and they'll, they'll use ain't, and this is supposed to be the uh, clue that this speaker is somehow from a marginalized variety of whatever language that they ought to be speaking, even if it isn't uh, English. Um, and then uh, another one that they have a, a lot of success with is the varying uh, dialects of Britain that are all over the place. And especially if, you're, if your readership is British, they'll be able to pick up on a lot of the differences. Um, very, very easily. Well, uh, even if your viewers are American, um, I think, well, like in the movie uh, Ever After, they did that. It's set in France, but everybody speaks with a British accent, even though most of the actors are actually American. And the reason they did that is because it's very easy, even as uh, an American audience, to pick up on the class divisions, on these broad class divisions between these people. So, you know, like, um, the girl who's the Cinderella girl, she speaks with an upper-class British accent, mm -hmm. while the servants that are her friends speak with lower-class British accents. So you're supposed to know that she's the diamond in the rough here, you know, that, <laughs> that she's actually, you know, the blue blood cast down amongst... And, you know, and it's actually, it's one of those things, like, it's kind of silly because they're in France, why do they have English accents? But at the same time, it's actually very effective in conveying certain class right. information to the mm -hmm. audience. I would call that I would call that uh, sort of it's sort of like a translation problem. You're going to say, okay, I want to flag this kind, this particular kind of language distinction, but I have no way of doing rendering it in the original language. So I'm just going to take the whole problem and sort of translate it into an English language analog that will allow people to comprehend what the distinctions are in a more meaningful way. Yeah, and I thought it actually worked pretty well in that movie, but often when you're reading a book and, like, you've got these people who, like, they're supposed to be of Asian descent in space, and they're speaking with a Cockney accent, you're like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> you're breaking my brain. It's not working. The belief kind of stopped, didn't it? There was no sort of, there is no, there's just kind of like, what? Well, and you know what? There was also How to Train Your Dragon, where all the Vikings were Scots. Yeah! <laughs> that was a bit baffling. I was like, okay, I'll go with it, but huh? <laughs> Except for Hiccup. 
Except oh, Chekhov, yeah. who was American, right? Because, you know, the main character always has to be American. Right? Well, yeah. how else will we know he's normal? <laughs> As a non-American, I feel offended by that. <laughs> no, I mean, Chocolat did the same sort of thing. I, I was yes. watching the movie for um, college. I uh, chewed to put it on for like the first five minutes. And I just sat there going... Okay, I've seen this movie six times. They're French, but it, it, they might as well all be English in a tiny little English village that's <laughs> been transplanted to France. Yeah. It, it was weird. It's just like, France, not England. What? Yeah. I mean, you could probably do it with American accents. I mean, if you think about sort of like the bog down American accent to the kind of deep south sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, it they... would be a lot more difficult to understand. They, they did do that for Amadeus, which is something I found extremely distracting. Um, they, they just had all of the actors speak with whatever their normal accent was, um, as opposed to trying to affect a German accent. Um, which is really bad. Yeah, yeah, so like the, in particular, the one that was always most distracting for me was, uh, was, was um, Mozart's uh, Paramour who is just a very, very, very just a regular American Californian accent. <laughs> and kept kept referring to him as Wolfie. Oh, that's um, the what? heck out of me. You're right. Yeah. You're right. I remember that. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I mean, it was a stylistic decision. You know, whatever. You, you can make him. Mm-hmm. But it just Wolfie made... just lowers the tone. In fact, yeah. there is no tone. Yeah. All right, so it definitely can be done badly, and and um, and actually, my my general uh, take on this whole thing is that one should try to avoid uh, rendering dialects in spelling because mm. um, it's extremely awkward. Uh, makes it, it slows you down really. It, it makes it makes everything more clunky, um, and and it's uh, and it's associated. In uh, so much in literature with um, cultural judgments uh, that are very distasteful, um, that you have to be very careful uh, when you do it, and you certainly uh, should not be using the the uh, what was mentioned earlier with the uh, you know. Uh, trying to establish that somebody is of a stigmatized group by using uh, spelled versions of stigmatized American pronunciation. Whew. Uh, oh, yeah, no, don't do it. Please, please don't do it. <laughs> um, I always wonder if it's easier when, if you were writing, like, say, a Span- Spanish language novel where, you know, the whole, like, phonetic spelling is is much more... <laughs> Like because all of our things, uh, the spelling is frozen. It doesn't represent your actual. It's all about your education level, not about how you actually say it, when, the well, way yeah. you spell things. So something that came up last time um, was that uh, higher classes will often speak conservative dialects because they are more likely to have literacy, which causes language change to slow. Mm. No. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that language change proceeds whether or not you're writing it down because, as we can see with American spell, uh, with, you know, English spelling right now, it, it, our spelling does not reflect the pronunciation even though it does, um, uh, it doesn't conserve the pronunciation of the olden days even though uh, it has been more conservative in maintaining its form. Um, but I suppose you could argue that literacy, and, and I think also, you know, things like television, where there is a, a standardized dialect for speaking on television, um, uh, will will tend to um, maybe have a slowing influence. What do you think, David? Is that something that's, that's borne out? Um, I think so, but I think that what it is, is, is really far simpler, which is that you maintain the linguistic structures in your head, that are useful to you. Uh-huh. And so if you're reading a lot of texts, especially older texts, it's useful for you to be able to understand, you know, mm-hmm. what, what what they are. And, and so you kind of maintain that vocabulary. 
where, whereas, uh, you know, somebody who isn't reading, like, especially uh, older texts that use antiquated vocabulary, somebody that isn't reading those things a lot of time, have no reason to maintain that vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But that goes, um, <laughs> that also goes the other way when it comes to, um, you know, as opposed to reading older stuff, um, keeping up with international communication. So, uh, you know, people that um, are just, you know, for example, uh, really enamored of modern British television are going to be maintaining um, a larger uh, British vocabulary than they mm -hmm. would otherwise because there's a need for them to do so. And the same goes for, you know, uh, for, for Brits that are watching American television. Um, right. And um, especially because of how simple uh, international communication is now. Um, <laughs> there is an impetus there for us. There is um, a motivation for us to want to be able to communicate with various parts of the world, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 it both kind of homogenizes things and allows and, and, and expands the vocabulary and the language patterns of somebody who would otherwise be more limited and narrow in, in what they need to do because, um, you know, it's useful to be able to understand somebody from Australia. It's useful to be able to understand somebody from every single part of Britain because that's actually something that could be or is a part of our everyday lives that, and that wouldn't have been the case, um, you know, a hundred years ago where you're pretty much just communicating with people around you. I mean, even those, you know, who were participating in international travel, you know, mm -hmm. ships um, and usually just between certain very well-established, uh, you know, locations. You weren't going all over the world instantly just to chat with somebody for a few minutes. Um, I will also, I will also uh, mention that um, dialect can be perceived as a cultural value in terms of uh, being an indicator of group membership. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So maintaining one's own ability to speak in a local dialect means that you are one of the insiders in that area and and uh, and because of that uh, being able to speak in the local dialect has a very very strong value for many people and also because of that if as an author you're going to be writing or working uh, on some visual auditory media event thing and you want to use a dialect the best uh, an existing dialect you have to be very 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 careful because uh, group membership and pride and uh, cultural appropriation are all pitfalls that you can run into when you are using dialect and um, it's uh, it's a minefield. In fact, you want to make sure that if you are using a local dialect, that you are using it appropriately, and that you have a source or preferably several sources to tell you whether you are doing it correctly. Mm. And with that in mind, I'm going to pick up a book, Tina Lights of Blood and Honey. She is an American author and a very very cool person. And this book is. Um, basically uh, about the troubles in Northern Ireland with Fay involved. Woo! Okay. Uh, yeah, it is extremely edgy and extremely cool. I mean, that's and, quite a hard subject to go for anyway, because, you know, yeah. you, over here, you still talk about the troubles with this kind of like, it's the subject you don't touch. Even if you're kind of British and you're not sort of Protestant or Catholic or Irish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is a fascinating book and one of the things that she did was she just did years and years and years and years of research. Um, and I spoke with her personally about some of the research that she did, but she, you know, read Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Irish authors. She wasn't actually able to go to Northern Ireland herself, but she just basically did everything but. Um, mm -hmm. And she came out with some really fantastic stuff. Um, <laughs> here's, here's the opening. Got one of the yabos, sir. Liam lay on the cracked pavement with a British soldier's boot planted in the center of his back, struggling against the pain to breathe. Thoughts galloped through his head in one long stream. 
Oh, God, please don't shoot. Wasn't throwing stones. I don't want to die. I'll never sleep with Mary. Kate, if I do, sh Jesus, I'm sorry. I swear I'll never touch her again. I know it's a mortal sin. No venial, no mortal. Oh, for fuck's sake, what's the difference? Crikey. I haven't heard Jabba in quite a very long time. Also, it was like the accent that just kind of came out of the end there. Uh, you know, so I, can't, I admit, I cannot do the accent, so that was why I did not attempt it. But... We are not working in auditory dialects here. We're working in written dialects. Hmm. And I can read that, and I get the feeling of where I am even when I'm not able to hear the precise uh, accent in my head. Hmm. Um, and Stina has told me that, that there are people who've read this book who, uh, from Northern Ireland who have thought she was one of them. So she has obviously done a really, really good job with it. Um, like the highest compliment ever. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, and if you're if you're at all curious, I highly recommend the book because it's fascinating. Um, uh, let me write the name down in the chat bar here. So, she it has a sequel which I have not yet read, but I need to. Um, so the point there being that you don't have to be a native but you need sources and if you are sufficiently well researched and you're sufficiently well um, you know have people involved in your editing and, and checking to make sure everything works well you can get amazing effects um, even for people who have no idea what the original accent would actually sound like. Um. Yeah, I, I do that when I'm reading something that's very well written. I definitely hear a dialect. Now, whether, it's, whether I'm hearing it correctly is another question, but when it's but well written. Do you need to is <laughs> yeah. the question, really. I mean, for, for your personal enjoyment, you don't necessarily need to. You can kind exactly. of hazard it, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> the fact that I'm hearing, oh, well, this character is speaking in one way and the other character speaking in another way is, mm -hmm. is all I need. Right, exactly. Um, and so that one stands out for me as an example of an actual world dialect that was done really really well in us in a work of speculative fiction so um, totally recommended uh, so so for for a second let's look at um, other dialects that are really not of this world <laughs> um, because when you're moving outside of this world you can create your own dialect however you would like and you're not necessarily accountable to a particular world population for your accuracy um, on the other hand if you don't kind of have a feel for it then uh, it will come across as contrived um, so this is where we start getting into voice from, from my point of view, and I'm talking here about narrative voice, and, and I think dialect's relevant to that um, because uh, there was a discussion that I participated in on the Absolute Right Forum uh, uh, recently, well, not super recently, but um, hang on, I'm writing something down. I get so excited that I forget to write things down and then I have a hard time writing my report. Uh, <laughs> but um, where sh the, one of the people in the discussion was talking about voice and saying, well, you should never use voice in your narrative um, because it just doesn't work. And, and, and she used the example of somebody who just puts in fucking every other word. Every other word. And the fucking this and the fucking that. I'm like, well, yeah, I don't recommend doing it that way. But on the other hand, that's really not a voice. That's, um, you know, like uh, static. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, static in your communication is, is what we're looking at there. Um, 
but it can be done well, and if it is done well, then then so much the better, right? Um, so let me see if I can find this example from the from the Mike Flynn piece. Um, <laughs> And this is going to be really interesting because I'm uh, Theodork Suna Nagarajan, the Iron Hand, slept on the open prairie in a spot no wise man would have chosen for a camp, and in which therefore no cunning man would think to find him. And cunning indeed were the men who followed the spoor of the son of Nagarajan. It was a cold camp. Fire warms and counsels and keeps at bay certain creatures, but others it beckons, and those others Theodork was in disinclined to signal. On all the great grass he feared no man, but fearing a score of men was another matter. One serpentine he could meet knife to knife, half the clan maybe, but not all the serps all at once. It would be a song-bound feat even to evade them. So I get a feeling of local dialect out of that. And I think that it comes uh, in part from uh, words specific made up vocabulary like song bound feet. Um, song bound, of course. Uh, there's some archaic, uh, I, I guess, uh, more archaic language like a score of men. That's um, really old English, though. Same with like cunning man, that's English. We're talking like, you know, pre Shakespeare. Old, old. Right. So these are words so that true. have old, old style. You know, uh, very early etymologies, mm. and that imparts uh, a flavor to the text that I think um, gives you a sense of locality and culture behind this particular person. I'm uh, going to go for dark ages, kind of medieval-y. So you kind of, it's it's a good fantasy setting in that respect. Mm-hmm. And there's something in there too of the the rhythm of the sentence and the the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Of um, yes. And in fact, I uh, when I do dialects in my work, I like to make sure that I'm thinking about um, rhythm and um, meter, uh, because that is one of the things that is most distinctive about. Uh, dialects and the different ways that people speak. Um, so they say that when you hear a word, every meaning that for it that you have ever heard pops up in your head to some degree. Um, and so every, basically, it sort of activates every instance of that word that you've ever heard. And that's where all the sort of flavors of language uh, tend to arise from. So there are words that we don't hear very often that are ex uh, associated with very specific types of contexts. And oh, we bring them up without fail when we hear that word. Um, whereas the words that are used most often become generic because they've been heard in so many different contexts that they've become dissociated from any one particular context. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something very useful to keep in mind when you're working with um, dialogue and text. Uh, especially words whose uh, context is so narrow that uh, using them out of that context can only can do nothing but bring up the uh, the, the normal associated context. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking of a word like you know unrequited, mm -hmm. which you know pretty much has nothing but love coming after it ever. Yeah. <laughs> unrequited, uh, yeah. Unrequited sorrow. Yeah, you can. Um, do. Unrequited is just a depressing word that you know gets used badly too much by um, you know trashy romance and all the other sort of you know worst movies in the world. But let's not but let's not imply that all romance is trashy because it's not. No. Um, <laughs> so um, okay, so I'm gonna give you another uh, another fun voice. Uh, I'm enjoying this just for the voices. Because I listen to a lot of audiobooks, so a lot of the time I don't have to worry about listening for the accents. The person narrating the audiobook, especially someone like Mary Robinette Cowell, she's always yeah, doing yeah, yeah. her, so I hear them anyway. 
Um, yeah, she does a fantastic I job. I don't really think about all the voices because I'm too used to hearing the person doing them. Books. <laughs> um. Here's here's um. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna. Uh, this is from Janice Hardy's The Shifter. <coughs> stealing eggs is a lot harder than stealing the whole chicken. With chickens, you just grab a hen, stuff her in a sack, and make your escape. But for eggs, you have to stick your hand under a sleeping chicken. Chickens don't like this. They wake all spooked and start pecking holes in your arm or your face if it's close. <laughs> they squawk something terrible. The trick is to wake the chicken first, then go for the eggs. I'm embarrassed to say how long it took me to figure this out. Skipping ahead a little bit. A voice came from beside me. Don't move. Two words I didn't want to hear was someone else's chicken under my arm. I froze. The chicken didn't. Her scaly feet flailed towards the eggs. It should have been my breakfast. I looked up at a cute night guard, not much older than me, perhaps 16. The night was more humid than usual, but a slight breeze blew his sand pale hair. A soldier's cut, but a month or two grown out. Stay calm, stay alert. As Granny Ma used to say, if you're caught with the cake, you might as well offer them a piece. Not sure how that applied to chickens, though. I <laughs> <laughs> that. Because it's awesome, because it's got chickens in it. <laughs> I'm going to go off a complete fable diatribe and start kicking them. <laughs> so chickens give so much flavor to that, first of all. Mm, um, tasty. Uh, literal uh, literal uh, evoked flavor, as well as, as, as an entire sense of economy and environment and and all kinds of things that are associated with chickens. Um, and then, of course, there's Granny Ma uh, and her sayings. And uh, she Janice uses Granny Ma and her sayings all through the book, and they just give it so much feeling. Hmm. Uh, well, even her name. Granny Ma? Granny it's Ma not, sounds... It's yes, not it's a dialect sort of feel ways. to it, right? Yeah. What's yeah. the name of it again? It's called The Shifter by Janice Hardy. I'll flash it up here. It's got a different up. name in the UK. I think it's like The Healer's War or something. The Healing War. Yeah. yeah. I, remember thinking, I remember thinking the cover's really pretty, and it's like, that's not what it's called over here. Yeah. yeah I just put no, a whole lot of it in the um, LAPL. <laughs> actually, in the UK, it's called The Pain Merchants. Ah, that's it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they they changed the they changed the uh, title over here. I don't see why, because the title there that's a perfectly good title, and yet. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, this is actually quite relevant to what we're talking about. One of the reasons why the title was changed for the United States was, I think, that people felt that it might evoke drugs uh, yeah. in the United States and drug culture. And they did not want to e evoke that when trying to sell a book to middle grade kids' parents. Because drugs are bad, kids. You know. Um, so I think that entered into it. Oh, I guess so. Uh, books that change their names now because of, of title. It doesn't happen very often. I can't think of any other ones that have offhand that have just randomly been changed. Um, oh, there's law. Yes. Well, I think that uh, Harry Potter was changed. Yeah, yeah it was yeah, changed from was... the Philosopher's Stone to the... Um, Sorcerer's, what is it in Stone. Sorcerer's Stone. Which makes absolutely no sense because, you know, the Philosopher's Stone is kind of famous. You know, it's one of those yeah, yeah. things that... Yeah, yeah. but it's apparently a... more famous in the UK than in America or something, or we're all stupid over they, here or something, they, I don't know. There is this impression that Americans are stupid. It's really bothersome. Yes, you know, it is. Uh, it, it, one of the places that we see it the most this is nothing to do with the topic at hand, but um, in a lot of the early video games, uh, early Nintendo games, when oh, they yeah. shipped when they shipped to America, they would simplify them, and sometimes um, you know they would also like you know scrub <laughs> out things that they that you know American audience would find improper, but they would also just simplify the mechanics of the game uh, to a point where, like, certain things just didn't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. 
you just had to like memorize, oh, well, this happens, and it's because that a crucial <laughs> game element was removed because they thought, oh, American audiences, they won't get it. I think some of them were cultural elements, especially for like the early Final Fantasy games or whatnot. Yes, that's what I was thinking of. No well, idea. You know, it, it depends on who you ask, and in fact, yeah. I think that that this kind of thing can can inspire people to lift their game and not just go, oh, I'm not going to watch that because I don't get it. But for example, um, they they did focus groups concerning uh, the madness of King George. Oh yes, because everyone does. And the they decided movie. to call it the Madness of King George instead of the Madness of King George the Third because they worried that people would think it was the third installment of a trilogy yeah. of movies and wouldn't go to. I love it. that movie. I really love it's it. It's a wonderful it's... movie, but gah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, you know, monarchs. You have more than one by the same name. You stick a digit on the end. <laughs> okay, so um, so I wanted to read uh. Well, it's hard to say. I wanted to read two more things. Um, Just imagining people looking for the first two ones at the video store. <laughs> oh, dear, yes. Those, those sad, sad people. Um, anyway, go ahead. Okay, so... Um, uh, I'm not going to read my own stuff. I'm going to read something from Verna Vinci. Um... I can. Um, shoot, you know what? I'm not going to do that either. Ha! <laughs> uh, what I wanted to uh, the, the the reason I wanted to read from Cold Words and from from A Fire Upon the Deep was because each one of them involves a very specific kind of grammatical alteration uh, designed to convey alienness. Um, and in the case of Werner Vinge, he's got this. Um, I have a whole I have a whole article about it on my blog, um, uh, portraying a multiple individual. Basically, these these creatures are wolf creatures. Strangely enough, um, my cold birds folk are also wolf creatures, but they function in packs, and so they always talk about themselves in the plural and they talk about parts of themselves, you know, part of me felt like doing this, literally, <laughs> right? Because they're, <laughs> the individual is the pack, so, you know, part of him feels like going up and taking a lookout, and so he does, <laughs> right? While the rest of him stays down in the, in the shadows, or, or whatever it is. That's um, pretty cool, actually. It's a very cool book, and it's very well done. The, the aliens were my favorite, favorite part of the whole thing. Um, and uh, so that I thought was really effective but it was definitely playing with this it was how the change in the identity of the alien was played out in grammar I suppose you could say um, because they had to talk about themselves in the plural um, cold words involves something kind of different where I was playing around with um, how the language was used, and one of the things I wanted to do was convey that my that my character was a very decisive uh, creature of action, and so I never used uh, I never used am going to or am doing. I I tried to stay away from all kinds of stative constructions that would can talk about ongoing states of being, and I tried to stay with only things that conveyed action. So, uh, okay, so no thing present just... tense, in a sense. Yeah. Um, it's not as though there are no gerunds in the story. <laughs> uh, but just changing the balance there uh, has, has done a lot. Um, let's see. Parker stands waiting, his body showing agitated despite its covering clothes. I've told him many times that decorative cloth is most appropriately displayed on a wall, not dragged through mud and weather. But I won't chide now. I begin to fear for our project. Sort of a very short example. Um, but there were just little tiny things I wanted to change to make sure that he didn't sound like he was sort of sitting around musing about stuff. 
Um, wow. So, yeah, and I'm actually designing a, a, uh, a dialect right now which is a little bit different um, because it's a lower class dialect uh, for my Varan world. Um, and it also involves, actually, strangely, it resembles the Werner Vinge uh, example because it involves playing with plural and singular. Uh, it has a rule that Aaron may have heard when I read from it last week, uh, where once you reach the age of 19, you're referred to in the plural, um, essentially for, for politeness reasons. Um, and so it changes a lot of things and one of the things I have to be careful with is that when you start using plural you you lose information like gender uh, <laughs> and so when I'm writing using this dialect I have to make sure I'm very strict with the dialect in the dialogue but when I'm doing the narrative I have to be a little bit uh, be a little bit more conservative and keep my he's and she's in certain contexts so that I can make sure people understand who's speaking a little bit more clearly and how many of them there are <laughs> and and ha and keep keep people from losing those critical pieces of information that might potentially dissociate them from the narrative as a whole. Uh, you um, could also use the feminine they. I could. Sorry. <laughs> I could create the I could create a feminine they, but yeah, no, it's uh um Burr. what's funny is that there are some dialects of English where where this pluralization does happen, and so it's not all that far away from certain dialects of English in 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 certain contexts. It's actually um, it's actually a very common one cross linguistically, either using yeah. the second person plural to refer to people or using the third person plural to refer to people, um, and it's just because it's thought of as being less direct and therefore less likely to cause offense. Uh -huh. and also the vu uh, across languages uh, is considered to be more formal. Um, and less sort of claiming of intimacy, right? But it's also a plural, so it sort of, you know, spreads the implications a little bit, um, probably in its etymology. Um, yeah. So yeah. if you don't, we're, we're right on 12 o'clock, and I know you have to go, David. I'll just right. um, read a little tiny piece of this um, that I'm working on right now. Um, <clears throat> as soon as he was gone, Corbin and uh, the guy just left. As soon as he was gone, Corbin went to the counter and counted in his share of rent. Bossy came beside him and counted in 210. He made up the difference without a word. Without a word. We got an idea, she said. It's a secret, but it might get all us good and out of this. Corbin gave an exasperated sigh. Secret? Bossy, that was your trouble tonight in the first place. Didn't your mama tell you good folk don't keep secrets? Secret. Not that kind. She put a knee up on the counter and hiked herself up till she could reach behind the steam hood. It's a family secret. We heard you say you could read just now. Well, see if you can read this. In his hands, she placed a small foil-wrapped packet. It was old. That was plain. Corbin had peeled it open carefully, and an incredible smell wafted out. Inside were pages and pages of fibrous paper covered in handwritten notes. He shook his head. Bossy, you never bought yourself. This is a fortune. How'd you come by it? It belonged to our grandma's grandpa, we were told, but Cora, that's not the point. Tells of a stash somewhere in the adjuncts, the biggest one he ever heard of. Biggest? Serious? It'd have to be pretty big then. His own stash wasn't so shabby. After years of reading and saving, he collected enough Orsheth to have to shift it behind a tunnel hound's den where the hound could protect it from gangs like groomers. Not like this, we swear, soul's bargain. Bossy showed him her open hands. You help us fetch it, we'll give you a share. So, yeah. that's my current project. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, I like how you, you switch back to just the ordinary narrative voice a bit in the uh, narration so that you can tell who's who. It, you know what? You can try to get rid of that, but it 
it hurts you more than it helps you. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, what I've been trying to do is keep the all they construction for plurals in, even in the narrative voice, uh, but for the for the singular, I got to use he and she and not they and they because it's just too confusing. <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough to keep two characters distinguished when they're both male, right? And you have to use the name more, and you have to make sure you're you're ironing it out. It's best not to expand that problem. <laughs> so, um, anyway, we are out of time. Wow! Thank you all for coming. Uh, I feel like I could talk about this all day. Um, David, thanks for all of your great uh, contributions and talking about your work a little bit with us and. Thank you, everybody, for, for your contributions. It's, it's been a great discussion. Sure, I'm going to end our broadcast. Okay. Hold